um, let's just get get right started. Uh, okay, hi everybody, uh, hi Prince George, and hi everyone online. Uh, thanks again for coming to this month's RTVS uh, Resident Rounds. Every month we try to do something cool and something different, and today is a real treat. We have two real experienced eMERGE docs from uh, Vancouver and from the BC Emergency Medicine Network. And so they're going to introduce themselves in a second. Uh, Bryden Blacklaw's here from Kalaman Nation Territory in Powell River. I'm just working right now. It's been a good shift. Just lit, laced a stroke. And uh, oh, wow. yeah, so uh, I'm going to hand it over here to Jim and Frank, and they're going to talk to you for 40 minutes or so and have some good question and answer, I'm sure, as well. So again, thanks very much. And Jim and Frank, I'll let you guys introduce yourself. And thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. All right. Go ahead, Frank. Hi hey everybody, uh, my name is Frank Schirmeyer. I'm one of the emergency physicians at St. Paul's Hospital. I um, half-time clinical, half-time research. I, uh, my uh, expertise, I guess, is in uh, chest pain, cardiovascular emergencies, atrial fibrillation, and addictions medicine. Um, I um, was a family medicine resident and um, worked six months in Hinton, Alberta, and uh, then came to Vancouver and, you know, bounced around for a little bit and eventually did a master's degree and uh, got involved in research. So I haven't exactly the typical career with regards to that, but I think things have worked out okay. Uh, my rural time in British Columbia has been spent in Golden uh, a few years ago. So um, anyway, I'm uh, lucky enough to work with Floyd Besser, whom I'm sure you all know pretty well. And we're just here to talk about the... Um, I'll let Dr. Christensen introduce a bit more about the British Columbia Emergency Medicine Network, which is designed to assist patients and physicians across British Columbia during emergencies. Thanks, Frank. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jim Christensen. I'm um, uh, not practicing emergency medicine anymore, but I did it for 38 years, so I hope that gives me some credibility. Um, I've been a researcher and a clinician and administrator. I was the head of the Department of Emergency Medicine at UBC from um, 2010 to just this past January. And um, when we first started that off, we, um, we had uh, typical sort of things. When I took over that, that job, we had a strategic planning session. And we said, well, what's our vision? And um, I, I was pretty adamant that our vision was not about doing academics, which was hard for some academics to hear. It was about improving care. And through academics, through leadership, through research, and through teaching. But we didn't have any mechanism to really do that. So this, this idea started to form about how we're going to do this. Well, let's develop a network that goes far beyond the university walls and includes everybody who practices um, uh, uh, emergency care in the province. And we started with physicians. There are about 1,400 physicians in the province who provide emergency care. Half of them do it as part of their general practice. And, um, and we wanted to sort of reach out in that. And we did that, we built a network, which we're gonna talk a little bit about here and what it is. So the Emergency Medicine Network has been in place now for about four years. We're continually um, trying to make sure that it uh, meets the needs of providers out there. We're about this year to go beyond physicians and actually welcoming nurses onto the network and trying to meet their needs uh, with, um, uh, in various ways. And so um, let me ask the first question here. How many of you uh, have accessed the BC Emergency Medicine Network? Can you put your hands up if you have? Okay, we have a naive audience, Frank. This is great. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, so do you want me just to get going on mine? Rebecca, is that fair? I'll start working. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Can uh, let me go down to here? Can everybody see that? If you have questions, just shout out because so I can see it. I have to sort of shrink here. I can't see everybody at the same time, anyways, and then I have to kind of shrink it. So um, just shout out and interrupt me. I don't mind. That's let's make this really informal. Make it a conversation if we can. So. Um, the BC Emergency Medicine Network um, has uh, uh, an important um, role to play, I think, in doing a number of things, both supporting and in sharing. And I'm gonna get to see if I can do this. 
So of the 1,400 or so, um, over 1,100 physician practitioners, I won't call them emergency physicians because you know, full-time immersed docs call themselves emergency physicians, but general practitioners in small communities don't consider themselves to be um, emergency physicians any more than they consider themselves to be obstetricians or psychiatrists or whatever. So, um, but of those, of those uh, physicians, um, we, we have the majority, the vast majority. And, and people are contributing to the network in various ways. Um, we, we, uh, one of the things that I, I truly do believe is that there's no doc out there who knows everything that you need to know about emergency medicine. But as a group, as a community, we do. And so the, the issue is how are we going to bring that together and how are we going to share that? So the tool is the website right now where you can access some of this information and we're going to show you that. So there's our vision, exceptional emergency care everywhere. And our mission is sharing, supporting and motivating to improve emergency care. So that's what we wanna do. We want this to be a place where we can bring information together and a place where we can talk to each other. And in fact, if you really took it to its ultimate, instead of there being 105 separate emergency departments in the province, why not think of it as one? and we all talk to each other. So there's lots of components on here and I'm just gonna go through these really quickly and then we're gonna actually go live. Hopefully that's gonna work. Um, so I can show you how to use it. And you should all sign up. You don't have to be a member to actually access the resources. You have to be a member to post a blog or to criticize us and we like criticism. We like it to do that, to tell us what needs to be improved. Um, but you do have to be a member and it doesn't cost anything to be a member. You just have to be have a license to practice in BC. Um, and so there's uh, we have it organized so that you can go through different, like a textbook kind of thing and look for all of the different kinds of things that might be related to cardiovascular stuff or dermatology or COVID. Um, we have a CPD section where we try to keep up to date with upcoming um, uh, conferences, et cetera, and meetings, and, um, and you should be able to go there. And if you link on it, it just, if you hit on it, it just takes you immediately to the site where you can register. So that, that concept, and as we talk about a few more of these things, that concept is about if you need some information about emergency medicine in BC, you should actually go to the, the BC Emergency Medicine Network because it, it doesn't build everything by itself, but it'll link you to the things that you need. And if there's things that you need that we don't have, we want you to tell us about it. So simulation resources, we're really trying to grow this so that it's, um, it's easier for people in smaller centers. And we have a couple of examples of this where people are, we're trying to help them with teaching them how to be better facilitators, but also pulling together a library of cases that um, because there were many smaller simulation centers across the province and everybody was developing their own. And so why don't we bring together and share them? So that's on there. Um, and uh, we can have uh, many other things related to, um, to emergency medicine, like procedural videos, for instance, um, and other websites and apps that we can click on. Um, there's patient discharge summaries, for instance, in the clinical resources. So there's almost 250 of these, some of them in multiple languages. And I'll show you that later. In fact, we'll, we'll just walk through that and show you where they are. So you can actually uh, print something out, or in fact, you can just uh, text the patient um, the link and they'll have it then on their phone once they open that up. We've really supported real-time virtual support. Bryden's a real leader in that. And um, it's been one of our main pillars right from the start. And so collaborating with the Rural Coordinating Center of BC um, we've, we've uh, I think, played a significant influential role in, uh, in helping those, um, uh, those real-time support systems become accessible to rural docs. And, um, and then you can uh, look for, for podcasts, look for comments, um, have people engaged in discussions uh, of various topic, whatever topic you think is relevant. It can be administrative, it can be purely clinical. We don't put um, actual clinical cases on here that anybody could, or people could maybe identify, um, but talk about the principles or the pr problems with different um, aspects of care. And then we've got um, some larger podcasts, not just the, the blogs and, and discussions in print, but a really interesting group of podcasts that you can listen to. Some of them are sort of um, 
people that are well known in our field and in our community talking about their life and stuff. There's some basic clinical stuff like recently a couple of five to 10 minute podcasts on sepsis and on the agitated patient. And so it's a different way to listen to various things that we're trying to build a bit bigger library of. So we want you to use it. So go and, and um, you can put it on your phone. There's a mobile version. We're talking now about making it an app. It's an expensive process and we think we're gonna go that way. And we're just trying to find out exactly the, the things that we want to be on the app because we don't want everything that's on the, the website to be on the app because it would be too cumbersome. But there's a, all the way through the, um, uh, once you become a member all the way through the website, there's the opportunity to hit a button for feedback and for, for you to um, tell us. You know, I looked for something and I couldn't find it. You know, is it there? Well, yes, but um, that tells us that it's not very easily accessible or searchable, or it's not there. And it tells us there's a need out there and we need to put something on there about it. So um, there's uh, lots of partners involved with this. Um, and it's not just uh, sort of a bunch of, you know, MERS docs working over there, there, um, at the side of their on the side of their desk and it takes a fair bit of funding we're just moving uh from being part of the academic health science network and we'll probably we're working now towards a process to be under the provincial health service authority but we have lots of great partners including the rural coordinating center of bc as i said and um and um we, we need those partners to be able not to access but for their, them to provide their wisdom and experience to us now i'm going to step out of this and i'm going to take a risk here and i'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go to share screen again, and I'm going to go live to the network. So here we go. Now, can you see that there now? Can you see the network website um, front page? We, we can. I can. At least I can. Yes. Okay, good. Everybody can see that. So let's just sort of walk through then that, that how you might navigate this when you're on a shift. The, it should be accessible on every computer in every emergency department in, in the province. So there is an icon somewhere. We started out, we had that sort of on the front page where physicians um, work uh, on, that, uh, on their computer system, whatever it might be. Um, then as the IT people sort of start modifying things, sometimes it gets a bit buried. Sorry. Um, and um, so, so look for it and, and let us know if, in fact, if it's hard to find because we want it to be there where you can easily get to it. Or you can put it on your phone and, and you can do all of this stuff kind of from your phone, but it's not quite as, uh, as smooth as it is when it's on a desktop. So the clinical resources here, so you just hover over that and you get these kinds of things. So clinical summaries, again, we have about 250 of these things. We call them um, point of care clinical resources. And uh, um, there's uh, uh, what, what our philosophy was, and this was driven by people who um, we talked to about what they want. They didn't want to have, um, you know, something that was a 75-page clinical guideline that was maybe not that useful to them. Um, they wanted to have stuff that was um, that was relevant. So. Um, let's pick something here. Let me see what we can go into. So if you wanted to look at, uh, I don't know, let's see what we got under here. I can't, I can't remember them all. So let's look under neurological things. And so there's neurologic the, um, point of care clinical summaries. They're meant to be, if you've got a question about something, um, you know, how do you, uh, what, what are the things that you need to remember at two o'clock in the morning when you're a bit foggy and tired because you've been working all day as well? And so, um, you know, concussion in children. What do you? Uh, what What does that look like? And so, um, this is. Uh, let me see. Go here. And print the summary. Resource authors and comments. Okay, there's two things in here. All right. I knew this was going to happen if this if I did this. There we go. Hi, my name is Dr. Mike Evans, and, and this is a quick review of concussions, what they are and what to do. Now, you might have watched our Concussions 101 video, and this is just an updated version that covers even more. 
Concussions have got a lot of press. I think we can all now name a player or, or a friend that has had one. And I think we tend to hear about the bad cases. But I think it's also important to know that. So I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go through each of these in, in a lot of detail. I just want to show you. And that's an unusual one. So that's got that, um, that little summary like that. But if, um, and we can go back and we can go to, to any of these things, carbon monoxide toxicity diagnosis, you know, how do you do that? So here's a more common one, the context, the diagnostic process uh, for it, and uh, kind of what it means and the treatments and what you might want to do for it. So, um, and these are relatively short in three or four minutes, you can have a look at these and understand how the evidence supports them or not. Many of these things, there's not a lot of scientific evidence but so if you ask a question and you're just not sure of something, you want to make sure you don't miss anything, go and have a look at that. Under the, the um, clinical resources as well, patient discharge sheets. So when you go here, um, you want to look at something, I don't know, say animal and human bites. And what do you want to give that? Here's if you're signed in as a member, you can just text this. And if there's multiple languages, it'd be multiple languages, but you can just text this to your patient and they'll have it in their own system. And if you wanna just open it up and print it because they don't have the ability to text, then you can do that as well. So you don't have to, and we've, we're just gonna be sending out guidelines in the emergency departments about what's important about patient discharge. And patients often don't get much time with the physician in particular at the, when it's time to go home in a busy department anyway. So this makes it a lot easier for you, we hope. And, uh, so that's, there's uh, again, about 250 of those. Um, again, under the clinical resources, you can go down to procedural videos. So if you haven't done a procedure for you know, a couple of years, um, you can come to our um, procedural videos. Now you, you can do this yourself, right? You can go to, um, to the internet and you can search for, I don't know what it might be, how to tap an ankle. And um, or to how to do arthrocentesis on a shoulder, for instance, um, and um, and you'll get twenty hits, and you won't know which one which one's good, which ones are bad, and you have to you don't want to have to search through all that stuff. So we've done that work up front. So we've done that, and here is you know what we think is one of the better ones. It might be that um, uh, that you find one, and you got you know of one that's better than the one that we have here, and we would love to hear from you and for you to say, hey, I looked at your video was okay, but I, I know one, this one here is even better. We'll look at it and we'll say, you know what? You're right, that one is better. We'll take down ours and we'll put up yours. And that's how the membership can contribute to this. So you just look at that, we'll see how long. I haven't looked at all these and so I haven't practiced this. But um, so here's about arth arthrocentesis in a shoulder. If I can get this going. And so it's very, very- today. We are going to do a shoulder joint aspiration. Yeah. The posterior approach is performed by positioning the patient in an upright position with the left hand on the right shoulder. These are a series of very, very short ones that um, are just where the point of entry is for you to do an arthrocentesis. I'm sorry, but I uh, just had to get out of that for a minute. And now I'm going to have to get back into it. Um, so here's how, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing there, but BCEMN, you hit that. You want to get back in. Oops, sorry. You might have to hit share screen again. Um, well, I, think I, but I, I wonder if, can I do that? Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we are. Can you see where I am now? Yeah. Uh oh, hey. Um, oh, shoot. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Can you do it on Monday? No, it'd be better to do it today. Let me go open. Yeah, okay. Um, Frank. I'm going to let you carry on right now. I just wanted to show some examples of that. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I sort of apologize. Uh, somebody's come to do my drains uh, earlier than they were supposed to. Problem with doing this at home. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. 
And um, we'll come back and talk about, Frank's gonna talk about some actual examples and walk through all of those things. I just wanted to give you a general overview of the stuff that was there and there's still more to show you. And I'll be back with you uh, very, very shortly. All right, hello. Um, unfortunately, Jim has stolen my thunder a little bit here. I, the, the first case I'd worked up was actually, I was gonna walk everybody through a case of shoulder arthrocentesis of all the hundred something videos. That's exactly what Jim picked. So I'm, I'm gonna struggle a little bit here. It was a case I had in, uh, in Hinton as a resident and uh, I had no idea how to do it. And there's nothing up there and up to date was, a, you know, I mean, it, it, like, looking through this stuff was impossible trying to find something on YouTube was just remarkably challenging. So this really puts everything to, you know, in, in, into, into a bit more um, perspective. I'm going to share my screen here a little bit. There we go. Hang on. Dem -de -dem -de -dem. I should do it here. So let's see if that works. I'm going to go, hang on. This is a bit complicated here. So there. Okay, fair enough. So can you guys uh, see some sort of a screen here? We can. We can, all righty. So we'll, we'll go back here. And there's a, there's a COVID-19 thing here as well. You can probably reassure all your patients, all of whom I'm sure are highly vaccinated. Um, there is some place where you can comment, for example. So I'll start off with that here as well. There's some uh, member discussions here. And there's always some many questions here. And there's a number of one of our, uh, there's often some posts on what have we here, atrial fibrillation in small volume emergency departments. So there's a post there and a reply from a physician who lives in the Queen Charlotte's and, uh, you know, and there's some other posts here on, uh, you know, so you can post there, you can comment. And uh, if you feel so inclined, there is a blog. There's some very important podcasts as well here. One of the things we're just involved in, there's some, uh, let's see if this actually loads here. Here's our podcasts. So, and they're not all like half hour podcasts. Here's a five minute podcast for patients that are agitated and uh, you know, how to use ketamine for these. So these are half hour, let's discuss all the evidence. Let's have a you know, giant round table discussion when you have like a couple minutes, this gives it to you really, really quickly. It's, it's a quick clinical summary. Uh, obviously this is probably something you listen when you're driving in the car, an hour worth uh, you know, of, of podcast, but some of these are uh, you know, quite short and quite useful and they're in a ton of different topics. Uh, so when you go back to clinical resources, which Dr. Christensen showed, um, start off with, you know, I was going to use arthrocentesis, but that's been <laughs> taken care of pretty nicely. So uh, let's go through our um, ECG is always challenging to read. You don't want to wake up your cardiologist. Hey, Jim, if, if you're back and listening, uh, I had the arthrocentesis case lined up perfectly of all the videos. That was yes, I just, I was just flipping through. I didn't I know, even. I know, I know. So there are a ton of videos here. Uh, sorry, a ton of EKGs, and there's great EKG blogs, for example. Let's deal with something that's, you know, fairly common around here, and that's good old atrial fibrillation here. I think most of us know what that looks like, but maybe if you're really junior, you haven't seen it enough, or if it's two in the morning, you're like a little unsure, because this doesn't always, you know, doesn't always correspond, you know, you always get a textbook case. Let's pick on atrial fibrillation here and share the screen here, and, uh, and this is, uh, oh, this is swipe right from life in the fast lane I see. Very nicely done, but it saves you having time to look for everything. It's got a ton of information around it. It's got your typical rhythm strip showing the lack of a P wave and irregular, irregular rhythm. And if you're really interested, you can look at the mechanism of atrial fibrillation, but let's be realistic at two in the morning, you just want to fix the patient, right? So there's a lot of other ECGs as well. All, right. All kinds of stuff here. So. Again, it's not the world's greatest ECG repository, but it gives you the stuff you need without having ultra exotica here to clog you up. So after that, you might want to actually have a look at clinical resources once you've decided is that, and you're like, this patient is atrial fibrillation. What do I do with atrial fibrillation? Well, let's go to clinical summaries here. And atrial fibrillation is probably under cardiovascular, I'd imagine. And then look at that atrial fibrillation. There's a quick clinical summary here on atrial fibrillation. So what do you want to do with atrial fibrillation? So blah, 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 uh, pretty, pretty over, brief overview of context. And then we're going to divide it up here. What do you go to? Uh, so let's go to, is the patient high risk for a stroke? What do I do with that? Okay, let's switch to that. Okay, high risk. is my patient high risk for a stroke? You can read through that. And there's some discharge instructions right there or some treatment and discharge instructions right there. 
let's say you decide the patient's not high risk for a stroke, but they're low risk for a stroke. And then you can look at some more discharge or some more treatment and discharge instructions right there. Now, when should I bother a cardiologist? Hmm. If I can't control symptoms, patients should be admitted to hospital. Well, that seems pretty reasonable, but there's, so there's your threshold to call a cardiologist. So this gives you to fairly quickly without reading through some up-to-date level thing, where it is great information, but it's written by a cardiologist. It's not written for a you know, rural emergency practitioner. Uh, and uh, this gives it to you fairly quickly. And uh, then let's say you decide you're going to use rhythm control or rate control. All the information is here as well, along with semantic coagulation. Let's go back here and let's see you've actually fixed your patient. What can you do with that? Well, clinical summaries, sorry, uh, patient discharge information, sorry. Let's go to patient discharge sheets. And do we have an atrial fibrillation one here? Be nice if we did. Oh no, we don't have one. Hey, maybe we got to work on that, right? But uh, oh, after cardioversion, look at that. It fooled me because that after cardioversion is the atrial fibrillation. Let's have a look at the English thing here. The trouble is, you know, the patient's kind of groggy. You've moved on to another patient. You really have 20 minutes time to explain to a patient, you know, what the issue is. So this is kindly provided by Fraser Health. And then it describes everything about cardioversions. And what you do is you print it out, give it to the patient, and then say, look, if you have any questions or something's not explained so good, you know, please, uh, please talk to me. And it gives you all the information what the patient's to do for the next few days. And it saves you an awful lot of time. It standardizes a discharge approach. And it's written in, you know, fairly plain English. Uh, unfortunately, only in English. Uh, there's no translations there yet. But this is kind of how you can integrate this into um, seeing a patient, especially if it's something uncommon or strange or something you're not that comfortable with. And there's lots of times, like I, I do research in atrial fibrillation. There's lots of times that I have to scratch my head and say, what is going on here? Is this truly, sis? Is something else going on? I just got burned on a case recently where it looked like a slam dunk atrial fibrillation about 10 days after vaccination. Came back a couple days later, more AFib, you know, and I, you look everything up and there's nothing there on atrial fibrillation and COVID vaccines. In fact, you know, there's doesn't appear to be a relationship, but it came back three days later with a nice case of pericarditis. And, uh, you know, like I said, even people who are supposed to be research on this, we, we, we get humbled by this on a regular basis. This is a very humbling job. And at two in the morning, it's really humbling. And, uh, you know, the ability to look back and say, maybe I don't quite know what's going on, or maybe I'm going to look up, look up some stuff for backup is an invaluable tool, especially when you're deciding to say, do I throw the cardiologist out of bed at three in the morning for this case? Or is there a bit more information that's easily accessible in a low barrier pattern? So uh, this is quite valuable for you know, obvious stuff, maybe a bit less so, but it can help a great deal. It can help their nurses out as well. I mean, there's going to be lots of times people have a ton of questions, and this is unbelievably, unbelievably, uh, you know, useful. Allergic reactions are people have a ton of questions. When do I do this? Do I get a second shot? Do I have this? And these things take up your time, and that means you can't see the next patient. So you print out one of these things and you know, patients can print these things out and, and patients can read these things. Let's say a really common one. Do we have, um, uh, there we go. So I work at a site, which is an inner city site and people step on needles. They, they get poked. Uh, they have blood and body fluid exposures and this happens everywhere. We just, we just see a bit more of it. And before I generally go into a long discussion about things, I have a very brief discussion. I print out a form because there's actually quite a bit to talk about. And I hand that over to the patient. And 15 minutes later, I come back and say, look, what can I explain better? Do you have any other questions? How more can we help you? And by this time, the patient's been primed very nicely. I can have seen three other patients in the meantime, and that patient will be pretty happy. Because if I get asked a whole bunch of questions, I'm going to give inconsistent answers. It's going to take a bunch of time. So having a standardized approach to dealing with these things, often sometimes before you really interrogate the patient, can be unbelievably time-saving. And nurses can hand this stuff out too. It doesn't need a physician to hand this out. Uh, you know, this is stuff you can be sometimes given a triage if, if that's the main concern. So this can really save a lot of time, especially if you're the only physician on, the nurse is overworked, and uh, the patient has a lot of questions, which is going to happen. And uh, this saves you from any sort of mix-ups, any sort of omissions, any sort of miscalculation, because it's a standardized information that everybody in British Columbia can get. 
As for clinical resources, let's have a look at the clinical resources that are out there. A couple of mouse. So a, a tool is inversely proportional to, to the number of mouse clicks required to, to, to access it. So let's have a look at websites and apps. Okay, here we go. So there's a lot of stuff here. Saving you from having to type everything in. MD Calc's pretty valuable. This site here, Ortho Bullets, is really, really good. This is really good for physicians and for nurses. There's a whole bunch of really good ones here. This is children's emergency care across Canada, bronchiolitis, any sort of other issues. This is a terrific, terrific app. And it helps you, this jogs your memory. Like at two in the morning, I might not remember Trek even exists, but if I see that, it's there. And Trek is an app and uh, you know you can, um, you know, right now this doesn't appear to be a website here, but you can link to the app pretty easily. It's got a ton of information on it and uh, provides clinical summaries very quickly for all these complex pediatric things that you do not see very often. Uh, let's go quickly to ortho bullets, which some of you probably already know. And rather than have to think about it or type it in, it's got absolutely everything there. It's got a ton of whatever you want in there, there. videos, pathology, pathophysiology, great x-rays. Often I'll walk up to the patient and say, look here, this is what you have. And it'll be right on the website. And I often walk up patients to the computer and say, here, here's what you have. Just read through this or I print something out too. So it really helps engage patients. Instead of the physician just talking down to a patient, the patient actually read through this and maybe navigate this out on their own a bit if there's a computer there. And that way they can actively participate in their own uh, you know, diagnosis and, uh, and management it really helps engage patients and provides a bit more of a strong partnership. Like I said, especially at the two in the morning when you are really tired, but there's a ton of great options around here. Uh, Jim's gone through the videos. You've gone through the you know, patient discharge seats. There's all kinds of clinical summaries here. I'll dive back to that for a second. I don't know if at a resident you're that concerned about administration operational issues, but some of you will go on to lead departments or have QI positions. That information is all there. What do I do when I sedate a patient, for example, right? I don't do that that often. I've got a very junior respiratory therapist or nurse helping me out. It's got a lot of ready to access information that you will not get all the time. So this really is almost a good clearinghouse for emergency medicine, especially when you're under-resourced or under time or you're fatigued. And uh, it can really help impact. The patients are always impressed by this, They're impressed by willingness to go the extra mile and show them something rather than talk to them. And it's, it's this has saved my uh, my backside more than a few times when, when, when coming to rare or complex patients, or if just I'm too tired to really talk to a patient for very long, this has helped out a, a great deal. So and I briefly transfer care over to Jim for a second again. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Frank. Um, um, just a, a couple of little notes about this and then we'll get questions and you can ask questions and have a search for things and put us uh, on, the, on, on the fire firing line. Um, you saw when Frank showed you one of the patient information sheets, I think it was um, um, body fluid exposures. There was a little stamp up there that said patient approved. So we have, um, quite a large number of patient partners working with the um, with the network, and so they're going over them method uh, methodically, and um, they're looking at them from the point of view of a patient to make sure that the language is appropriate, to make sure that their needs are met on there, because they're mostly written by health professionals, and so um, we're taking that extra step. We've taken them from a bunch of different places because um, no place had all had the, the the full list that we have. Um, on the network, but um, so so patients are actually making sure that they're um, relevant to patients. The other thing I just want to mention to you: those extra um, little tools, tips, and tools. So um, you don't have to go there. So the Trek website, for instance, which is uh, translating emergency care for kids, is what it means. Fabulous website. People from across Canada, pediatric experts involved with that. You don't have to remember Trek. Um, to actually go and find stuff about pediatrics. So if you wanted to think, oh, what's the latest on bronchiolitis? I can't quite remember if we're given steroids or not anymore. Um, so you go to the, to the emergency medicine network and you just look up bronchiolitis and what you get there, when you get there, it's not something that we've made up because Trek is just too good. So we just have the link there. So you don't have to go to Trek and then go to bronchiolitis. 
if you're already in the emergency medicine network, you go to bronchiolitis and we'll send you to TREC, to the exact, what they call bottom line summaries um, in TREC, which is very similar to what our patient, um, uh, our point of care uh, clinical summaries are. So, um, so we've kind of gone over that pretty quickly for you. We've tried to do it a little bit sort of in a live demonstration so you can see re how relatively easy it is. And uh, let's stop and either get feedback questions um, tell us what we could do to improve it um, and uh, encourage you all at uh, wherever, whatever stage you are in your career to uh, have a look and consider it and, um, and then con contribute to it um, because we're together all better than anybody is individually. Yeah, we, we've talked enough. What do you think would help you out? When I was, when I, I'm old, but when, when I was first in practice and I had a little notebook in my pocket and, uh, you know, it's sort of, I still remember the dosage for aminophilin drip, Frank, that you'll laugh at that, but um, uh, um, that's where we used to keep it. And this is, this, this is the modern version of that. And uh, there's so much more information that you can have here. And, and we, we struggle, it takes a lot of effort to keep it updated, but um, and we're gonna push even harder to make sure all of those clinical resources are updated every year to make sure that you now, so you don't go there and it shows the last date was three years ago, and then you wonder about it. So we're gonna be putting extra effort into that. Has anybody gone there and had uh, an experience that was that would give us some um, good advice on, like good or bad? Um, I don't have a experience with the, the website. I think it's great though. Like it's really nice to have all that in one place. Um, something that with especially something like this that's linking to different websites that would be concerning. And it, it sounds like you're kind of preempting this a little bit by staying like the information up to date, but making sure that links are up to date mm -hmm. as like, like as like, cause links will like break over time. And so other people like change their URLs um, would be like really important. Cause like, yeah, the, the most frustrating thing would like, I don't think the most, the most frustrating thing wouldn't be to like go and like have the information not be up to date. Cause at least you'd probably like, you have information that you could use to help the patient. But if like you go and it's just like, you can't get through to all the links that it's like trying to link you through to would be really frustrating. So if there's somebody that's making sure that those are connected and up to date, that would be really great. Very excellent comment, and and that, that we tried we try to sort of go over them, but there's so many there. You know, there's uh, we probably need a method, uh, um, a sort of a methodical way to actually make sure we're checking them all, all the time. But yeah. as well, we're going to miss things at times, so um, that's why it's great to be a member. And and you know, if you go there, you get frustrated for sure. But to make sure the next person isn't frustrated, to just send us a note on the on the website with feedback and say, hey, I tried this, you bozos. And it's uh, it's not it's not working. It's linked. It's 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 broken. So um, and then we'll fix it very quickly. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Because I think like you're you guys have are like spot on with like not needing to like necessarily like create de novo like all this content for yourselves. But yeah, that would be like the risk with it for sure. Yeah, thanks. Great comment. I just think with with just on that topic with uh, broken links and that sort of thing. Um, I think there's a bit of a bystander effect. Um, you know, if you come across something that's broken, you figure, ah, someone else will, will tell them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's a way, um, I don't know if it would make a ton more work, but to have some quick way to just say, yeah, this link's broken, like a, like some kind of a button on the, on the page, like, um, well, on every page, sometimes you have to scroll down a little bit, but, um, there's, if you remember, there's always a place where you can say where it says feedback and, uh, or it might say something, no, but something obvious. So you should be able to just hit on a button. Um, Frank, do you want to pull it up again? Let's see if there, let's see if there's something like that. Let's show that. What is that? Um, do you want to pull up the website again, or, or I can do it? So right now. You still got it? Yeah. Maybe we'll pull up right now. Hang on. It just takes a second here to. I can share the screen, right? Maybe go to Brian. So another way to search is just right on the on the on the start. Just there's a, always a place where you can write in. So why don't you search for bronchiolitis, and that'll be like a. Um, uh, We're looking for a clinical summary here. Yes, it, it doesn't. It shouldn't really matter. So there, search clinical resources. Just put bronchiolitis in there, 
Yeah. Spell <laughs> <laughs> As an adult researcher, I never have to spell it. <laughs> hey, look at that. Garth Meckler and Trek as well. All righty. Yeah. Let's see what Dr. Meckler's got to say here. Wow. So that goes to Trek. So go down to the bottom, scroll down and see. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing for me to see too. There should be. Hmm. Are you logged in or not? I'm yeah. logged in. Oh, yeah. You are, you are logged into the website as I'm, a member? Okay. I'm never unlogged in. You know that, Jim. Mm -hmm. You know that. I, I'm never not logged in. No, but lo it's logged in the website? Because yeah. you're on the Trek website right now, not on the like the BC Emergency yeah. Network website. So it won't be at the bottom of this page. It'll be at the bottom of this. So, yeah. So, yeah uh, hmm. No, yeah, just, just go back. I'm trying to find it. So this is a really good point. Why is this not, it's supposed to be obvious on most pages. So just go go back one page and stay on that one, Frank, and see if there's ability to comment. Um, hmm. Are you at the bottom? See if we're right down the bottom. Yeah. The bottom right, the page, yeah. right to the top, go right to the top again, yeah. All right, there, feedback. There is, there's a feedback one on the left-hand yeah. side. Yeah, I knew it was there. So maybe it's not as obvious as it should be. You, but you just send, yeah, link is broken and submit. And that, so that's the easy way. I'm sorry, it, it's a good lesson for us. You know, it took us a little while to actually find that. So um, that partially answers your question, but not a uh, hundred percent better. So let's make that easier. Are there plans for uh, an app development? So we're talking, yeah. Um, People started asking us about that a couple of years ago. And um, um, we, we, we thought about it and we talked to people about it. And because it was mobile friendly, we didn't really understand what the advantage would be of an app. And then people kept asking more and more. And so um, we are, we understand it a bit more now. And um, so with the app, you can have the information will be there whether you're connected to the internet or not. Currently you have to be connected to the internet. And so, and it's, it should be easier. And we know that it's better to have it on your phone when you're at the patient's bedside. You don't wanna go back to the, the desk and you know go on there and to do something or what, whatever. So, um, you know, like printing discharge numbers or sending the text to the patient. So we're currently actually the, the developer of our website, they develop apps as well. We're having focus groups to really clearly understand when we build an app, what are the things that are critical that people want on the app, not to put every, just put everything on there. It's a big decision because you know, it costs a lot of money to build an app, way more than I thought. But also um, there's no way I'm told, and if you, get, if you get technical geeks out in the crowd, tell me if I'm wrong, please. But we're told at this point that there's no way to link the app to the website, for instance. So if we change something on the website, say we corrected Apex because there was some new information, um, we have to go back and do the same thing on the app. It won't just mirror it and then bring it on, uh, you know, change it in one place and it'll change it in both. So I think the it depends maintenance... a bit on how you structure your database, but you can have a shared database between like an app and a website. That makes sense. Um, I guess what we have now is we've been doing everything on the website. So um, it may be that um, we have to change that whole structure then. So that, but it'll depend on what people want to have on the app, which I'm presuming is going to be a lot of the clinical resources. Um, thank you. Makes sense. Now, that, probably the people that we're working with would know that, but um, I don't know why that seems to be something that would be quite difficult to do. But we're going to we're, we're we're pushing forward to it because um, this. I mean, we we pride ourselves in being a bottom up network, meaning we're driven by users' needs. And if the users tell us over and over again that they need to have an app, even if it's costly. It's something that we we are stri striving very hard to do it, but if we do it, we want to do it right. What do you think would be the advantage of an app versus a mobile-friendly platform? Is it that connectivity that uh, issue? 
or is it something else that makes it easier to use? Because we want it to be easy. I think the, the biggest thing that pops into my mind is the connectivity, um, especially if you're working like rural remote or like have unstable Wi-Fi. Um, especially, yeah, if you're in a setting where it's not accessible. And I think in BC in particular, we have a lot of areas that are like that. Um, does anybody yeah. else have reasons why they like apps versus? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, 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 that's, that's a good reason. And it's, it, it boggles my mind why our Wi-Fi should be um, unstable in, in a hospital setting. <laughs> but there's lots of times, you know, one of the things we talk about is that um, emergencies don't just happen in emergency departments. They happen in small clinics. They have to happen at home when you happen to be with somebody. And, um, and so there, are, there could be lots of places where you could use this information. Sorry, I interrupted. I, I once worked in an emergency, emergency department in like downtown Edmonton that the radiology department was right next to, and you couldn't get Wi-Fi <laughs> in, the, in the department. You had to like walk out of the out of the department to be able to like look up things up and like up to date. So I think the other thing too is like if you want people to use it, um, I think if it's sitting on their phone and the icon is there and they recognize it, um, mm -hmm. it's it's possibly just like if it's sitting there next to like. Pocket EM and PD Stat. It's just like maybe a little bit more visually um, obvious as a place to go to get information if they, people haven't like fully integrated it into their like daily practice yet. So as a thought. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. All right, and I'm, I'm pretty... sorry. sorry. And readability on the website. If you open it on, say, a mobile device, I just wonder what the website looks like in terms of if the script is really small because it's on a website on a if you're opening even on a mobile device that would be my question if versus an app yep yeah so it might it might have um yeah that functionality in various ways but able to increase screen in the the font size etc yeah good point So we sold you on it? Do you think it's useful? If it's not, help us make it useful. Looks pretty cool. No, yeah, the website looks really good. All righty. Any other final thoughts? I would also just say that um, your team does a great job of um, your social media, so I would encourage residents to follow um, the BC Emergency Medicine Network on social media, because there's often um, just sharing of, of, you know, those podcasts or those um, stories or those little success stories. That's something that's really, I find really interesting um, from all across BC. Um, and that really makes, uh, I don't know, makes the engagement with the network um, a lot easier. Thanks, Rebecca. As a, as a Luddite, I don't, I don't, uh, I've, the, the whole team knows so much more about that, that social, we have a communications person who's full-time for communications. And so it's really important to do that. So I, I, I appreciate that comment a lot. And also um, you, you, there's a regular newsletter. We don't want to snow people all the time with emails and stuff, but um, if you're a member, I think it's every two weeks, you just get a little note that says, here's the new resources that have gone. Cause we're building it all the time. You know, we've got new resources and such and such and such and such. And so uh, um, you, it, we try to keep people sort of up to date and interested and, and we want to keep the website vibrant and, and uh, changing, not just static. Jim, should I just pull up the Twitter account really quickly here? Yeah, you go ahead. Fair enough. It's, it's actually pretty good, even if it did, it did miss one of our JAMA articles published this morning, which is actually a huge deal, but I'm sure we're working on that. Which uh, article, what, what was published this morning? Brian's JAMA article was published this morning. Who's? Brian what? Bruno's second JAMA oh, article. Another one? Yeah, no. another one. In vaccine oh. <laughs> zero conversion, it's pretty terrific. So here's what it looks like. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Actually, maybe BCMN, pardon me. Sorry. No results come on. I know you're right there. There you go. I should be it. Pretty easy to follow. 
um, you know, distinctive icon here. And uh, come on, I pulled up my phone here. So, you know, looking for a rural physician with knowledge of an interest in learning more about digital strategies. There you go. And this is something about, uh, you know, this is something we deal with every single day, right? With, you know, lots of information links to a webinar here. And here's a recent, uh, you, know, uh, you know, clinical summary on bone mets, which is brand new as well, right? So everything comes up there and uh, the, the, communications, the communications people are really very good at what they do and they're very engaging. They post videos, they post selfies, they, they, they know what they're doing more, a lot more than I do. So stop sharing now. <laughs> Just keep people engaged. But if you like it, spread the word, use it. Just use it, use it, use it. And, uh, and we'll keep working on the app side of things. That'll take a couple months. Don't expect it tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you all very much. I don't want to uh, keep you here any longer if the conversation is kind of uh, saturated. So um, it's really a pleasure to be talking to you all. And uh, and about something we love, especially. So, Rebecca, thank you. Said, yeah, you? thank you so much, Jim and Frank, for coming. Um, this was great. Um, and hopefully, we can have someone from your team back when the app is <laughs> in place to show that us that. Great. Somebody, but me, somebody <laughs> different than me. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. I'll I know how long that takes, though. Even even a website redevelopment is a is a huge deal. So, yeah. um, we won't expect it tomorrow. Huh. Okay, thanks very much, Rebecca. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>